Can you hear me? Great. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, the call and response. It's a wonderful way to start the day on a Saturday when we need to get our blood flowing. It's just kind of continuing to say hello and to greet one another. Um, as you heard, my name is Gary Bailey. And actually, I'm going to put this into my pocket as I'm thinking about it being swayed and pulling my pocket completely out of shape. And I have the, the very proud pleasure and distinction of being an associate professor at Simmons College in the School of Social Work, and also having an, a clinical associate professor appointment at the School of Health Studies. So I'm very delighted to be affiliated with this institution. Um, I'm coming to talk to you today about the color of fear, the paradox of race and oppression in the new millennium. And as I look at the other presentations, they all connect in this area in the ways in which we think about uh, the ways in which race is presented in the media and oppression is talked about in the media, the way race and class are represented in the area of health disparities. Uh, and clearly, uh, we have done 20 plus years of research in the field in the area of health disparities and understand the intersection of race and class. Anyone who has just heard for example, the new study that looks at uh, the increased costs for women for health care compared to men uh, can understand what it means to look at issues of oppression and then begin to understand what that means when you add race into that factor. It becomes a double, um, a double uh, burden uh, for individuals. Uh, when we look at obesity and obesity rates, it is very interesting when we look at the research that Marion Wright Edelman, who was in Marion Wright, and Robert Kennedy did in the Mississippi Delta of looking at the part of the country that was starving. Uh, and it really began to influence Johnson's war on poverty. We now look at that same area as having the greatest obesity rates in the country. And it isn't that people are eating um, better. They're eating things that are worse for them because they're still poor. Um, and that population is still uh, poor, um, black, and female. Uh, and so, in effect, we watch those comparisons and then to look at the intersection of the technological divide uh, and what does it mean about who has access. It's very interesting to me. Um, my partner's mother often talks about trying to get things when she is used to dealing in, at 87, is used to dealing with things where she has to go to get it. And when she calls up and people tell her, well, just go online, and she goes, what if you don't have online? And that, in effect, there are lots of people who are just, not just because they're old, but because they are poor, uh, because they live in communities without the kind of access, rural communities, et cetera, where technology becomes an enormous divide. So it's a wonderful way to begin, and it's an intersection of all of these pieces. Um, I'm a social worker, and that's slightly out of line. I'm a social worker, and the primary mission of the social work profession is to enhance human well-being and to help meet the basic human needs of all people, with particular attention to the needs and empowerment of people who are vulnerable, oppressed, and living in poverty. Social workers are sensitive to cultural and ethnic diversity and strive to end discrimination, oppression, poverty, and other forms of social injustice. Now that's uh, taken from the Social Work Code of Ethics, which is um, uh, held to by all of the states in the United States licensing boards, as well as affirmed um, by in Canada, and has been adapted in over 80 countries around the world. So that our code of ethics is the way in which we, as the largest group of providers of mental health services in the United States and other services to the poor, are required to operate. So that indeed part of the bedrock of our profession is working to end discrimination and oppression at all levels. And so I am doing this work both because it is work that I'm vested in personally, but also it is work that I'm charged to do by being a member of my profession. We are not the only group doing this work, but we are one of the few where it is embedded into our code and where we're held accountable if we operate outside of uh, that, those guidelines. I wanted to give us a historical glimpse of race, at the concept of race. Um, anybody here miss the election or realize we haven't had an election? <laughs> I, I just want to make sure, because I want to check where you've been, if you have missed the election. Um, anybody here miss discussions about race and gender? <laughs> 
uh, in this election. Anyone here believe that race was not uh, very much a part of what was going on uh, in this election? When we look at the primaries, what we looked at issues were issues of race and gender. Uh, we continue to look at those discussions, but indeed, uh, when one begins to look at some of the kind of debris that's now going on, and particularly some of the work coming out of the New York Times and NPR, which I think has done phenomenal work at local interviewing, of really hearing both what has progressed in America and places where indeed fear and deep-seated beliefs about what change means and fear in some ways that goes back to times of reconstruction. There are some places in the country where you would almost feel that the Civil War is still being fought. Uh, by some of the reactions and some of the ways in which people are conceptualizing what's going on. We've also, through this election, began to look at what it means to think about race differently in terms of, of what it means to be biracial, multiracial, and an emergence of, of, of an American society. And so a historical glimpse at the concept of race, institutional or structural racism is defined as the social, the economic, the educational, and political forces or policies. Now one may have power and not necessarily have policy, have that power enshrined into actual policy, but one is able to influence outcomes um, by uh, either access to uh, spheres of influence, um, by having control perhaps, of state houses or local governments or county governments here in our part of the country. We forget how powerful, anybody here grow up with a powerful county system uh, as part of your world? I did in Cleveland, Ohio, where indeed you have three areas of government. You had city government, state government, you had county government. And county government in some way was more powerful than city and state combined because it dealt with a lot of the services, had its own court systems, had it, uh, it was more than just the sheriff, uh, which is what it has come down to mean in many ways and registering deeds. And that becomes an important component. So it's that political forces or policies that operate to foster discriminatory outcomes or give preferences to members of one group over others, and it derives its genesis from the origins of race as a concept. Race as a biological fact has been invalidated by biologists and geneticists. So that race is something that we can measure. Uh, you know, the old way of thinking about race as being if you had one drop of black blood, therefore you are black, is just, it, it doesn't stand to the test of science. Um, I have uh, been fascinated by some of the work that Skip Gates, Henry Gates at Harvard is doing in helping to trace people's ancestry and people being very surprised at what their genetic pool looks like, particularly the one, I see people nodding, the one where he did Oprah Winfrey and some other folks who, where he looks at and says, well, this is who you think you may be when people dream where they might have come from, and this is what your genetic makeup looks like, and that the genetic piece is not really um, connected to the presence of pigment. So race is defined by being able to measure blood um, has been disproved. And so, but race as a social construct is very real. Physical traits still have meaning as markers of social race identity in every part of the world. And I do a lot of work internationally where indeed people can talk about nuanced differences about physical traits that help them know that someone is from one clan or tribe or a different ethnic group, that people can see certain physical variances. Um, it is this social race identity that confers placement in the social hierarchy of society and thereby accesses or to or denial of privileges, power, and wealth. One of the interesting things in what had went on in uh, Rwanda uh, in terms of the ethnic tensions and ethnic cleansings had to do with the way in which race had been socially constructed. That in effect, prior to uh, the imperial presence of the British in that area, that the tribes that ended up being in conflict had not been in conflict before, had intermarried and had lived together. But when one group who, as people, particularly the English, had intermarried and that their offspring and others began to be advantaged over others, what you began to watch was social placement in a way that created resentment from one group to the other, 
that results in a long-standing conflict that really didn't exist prior, but really had to do with who had access to what. You know, who was advantaged over whom. And so the way in which we construct, socially construct, people's placement in society is very significant. The whole concept of pigmentocracy uh, in most countries of the world in terms of what it means to have pigment or lack of pigment, and that can be intragroup and intergroup. So whiteness and darkness, but also skin color variation within communities can determine access to power. The status assignment based on skin color identity has evolved into complex social structures that promote a power differential between whites and various people of color. Racism and ethnocentrism. Racism is the practice of discrimination and prejudice based on racial classification supported by the power to enforce that prejudice. Uh, I chair the races, Dynamics of Racism and Oppression sequence at the School of Social Work, which is a foundation course, which means it's required of all of our students. And that is a foundation course in every school of social work in the United States that you have to have this content because of the communities with which we work, which is why I start with our code of ethics. It's important to ground this work in theory as you teach it. Well, what's very important here in the way in which I see and the way Simmons views the concepts of racism is that it is prejudice plus power equals the ism. Prejudice plus power. Prejudice absence power um, is it may be unpleasant, but it is not indeed something that can affect where you live, um, who you marry, um, what, you, what foods are in your neighborhood, what jobs you can aspire to. So it is the prejudice plus the power. And I give my students the example of um, I hate lima beans, and I hope that doesn't offend anybody here. I just hate them. And I think it is one of those things, like many children, children start out by building colors. It has nothing to do with taste, but we build food. So most kids love things that are red and start out because it's bright and that the greens are last. There's a reason for the greens. And the paler the green, the less likely it is to be on, on the child's plate. So that I don't like them. Hadn't tasted them, but I just didn't like them. Now, so I, I have lima beanism. Don't know any lima beans, haven't really tried lima beans, just don't like the color of them. That's the prejudice. I have no control over the crop. I can't determine. I've gone to people's homes and they have served them. I just have to not eat them. I have no choice about controlling other people's access, influence, or presence. However, if I were to wake up tomorrow and had the power to now decide that lima beans can't be grown. I have the power to stop crops. I don't like them. I've never eaten them. But I guarantee you, I don't want them anywhere around me, and I now have the power. I'm Secretary of Agriculture, let's say in another country. Secretary of Agriculture in a more autocratic nation, and I decide, get rid of all the crops. I don't want them anywhere near me. You're not, I don't care that you like, you're not allowed to have them. That's power. My prejudice now plus my power has exacted enormous toll on lima beans. It's exacted enormous toll on people who like lima beans. It has exacted a, an enormous toll on lima bean derivatives. Prejudice plus power equals the ism. Ethnocentrism is the view that one's own group is the center of everything and that all things are judged based on one's own group. You know, the old saying, why can't they be more like us? Well, the, the question is, who determined that the us was the measure? And that indeed, so often when we talk about the other, why can't they assimilate? And we'll talk about that in a moment. Why can't they learn the language? Why can't they do, why can't they behave? Why can't they, why can't they, all of those why can't they's, says that somewhere someone voted, and I don't know anybody who stood up we, where we voted on who determines what normal is or who determines what the way is, but it assumes that we all know that there is a way. And ethnocentrism. Prejudice is the negative or positive idealized attitudes, thoughts, 
And it's very important here as we think about prejudice that prejudice is just not the negative. Prejudice are those things that when we are with our family or groups who are like us, our, our clans, our tribes, our, our networks of people who share our values, beliefs, et cetera, where we nod our heads saying, well, you know, when they say that about us, it is true, because that's a good thing. We embrace this about being bright or being, um, I was saying recently with a group of female friends as I was sitting there as the only male listening to, again, how, in, how much, how the emotional intelligent quotient that women have, their, the intuition level that women have that you men don't have. And then I'm sitting there going, but isn't that a positive stereotype? Isn't that a prejudice that assumes that maybe I don't have that? But that's something that's a positive. So that we want to be able to understand that as we buy into the positives that we also open doors up for the negatives and that none of us in terms of prejudice and stereotypes, that stereotypes may be ex examples of reality, that stereotypes exist because indeed there may be an example that holds that true, but for everything you see there's also an, an exception or a negator to what you have seen. And so to be very careful about the ways in which we ascribe to entire communities, all or they or them become very powerful words when we talk in, in, as it relates to people. Not all people do anything. Not they do everything or them do. And anyone who has the numbers of people I see in couples work who come in where the trigger is you do this all the time. I, oh, I heard a murmur from the crowd. <laughs> because in effect, there is nothing that will get a fight going faster than being told I do something all the time. I, I did it this time. Yes, I did it the last time, but I don't do it all. That word all doesn't give us a lot of room in which to breathe. And discrimination is acting on the basis of prejudice. Discrimination is often codified by laws, regulations, and rules. Oppression. People experience oppression when they're deprived of human rights or dignity. Now, I just deliberately talk about human rights and not social justice, because human rights is very, very broad. And in effect, if we had more time, I could go into why, in effect, we look at issues of race and dealing with issues of racism in this country as a social justice issue, whereas in other parts of the world, it is viewed as a human rights issue. That is very much a political decision that goes back to the creation of the Human Rights Commission that Eleanor Roosevelt um, uh, was charged with uh, getting up and running at the UN. And it was a tension about what happens when we open up to the world if we are having a Philip Randolph and others were prepared to go to the United Nations to charge the U.S. with human rights violations as it related to African Americans or people of African descent in this country, particularly around lynching, because there was a pandemic of lynching going on in this nation and a desire to have rules put in place that made it illegal at the federal level. And when, that, uh, when people attempted to do that, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was challenged by Truman and said, if you open this up, then affect what you do is to allow communist countries to look at us when we're attempting to hold them accountable and that we do not have the high moral ground. And so this cannot come forth as a human rights issue. So in effect, we talk about it very differently, but we're talking about people's dignity, people's worth, people's value, people's ability to home, hearth, comfort, and, and, and future. And so people feel or are powerless to do anything about what is affecting them. Very important. It may not be your reality about how you view someone's potential, but it has so much to do with whether or not they feel powerless or powerful. It is as much about fact as feeling. Uh, sometimes the negative act is in the form of exclusion, uh, in which people are denied the opportunity to, to participate in a certain right, benefit, or privilege, uh, marginalization, that sense of invisibility, which results in decisions being made by those in power that may be harmful, simply because the needs were not considered. If someone is not in the room, and I often say in meetings that I have an obligation as a man to be able to make sure that issues of sexism are confronted even though women may not be at the table and in the room. I'm, are we only accountable if someone 
uh, who is different or of color is present to bring up the issue, or do we have an obligation based upon our understanding what the issue is to articulate uh, what is going on and a need to address and to make sure certain voices are brought to the table? Um, exclusion um, is something that we see less and less of because more and more we see that the exclusion is illegal, uh, so that we do not now, we do not see as many places where, in effect, people are not allowed to join or where there are covenants that say you cannot sell your house. But many of us grew up at a time, or if you look at your deeds, though it is now illegal under the law, friends of mine are working in California to undo covenants in their community that are built into their deeds, though they are now illegal, that talk about it not being, you're not allowed to sell your property um, to Negroes. And what does it mean? And in effect, their move is to get that erased. And what's been fascinating from my colleagues has been the resistance of people wanting to take that on. Well, the law has changed. Why do we need to do that? And what my friend is saying is it's symbolic. It's important that this still exists in our deed. And what happens if the law changes? And so don't you want to move those laws off the book? The cycle of oppression, that in effect, in our early years, we get lots of information very often our parents out of a desire to give us or making assumptions about what we as children and young people can understand give us misinformation, uh, that there is missing history, uh, that there is biased history, and that there is often indeed stereotyping, that we are then socialized, that cycle gets reinforced by the stereotypes we see or hear, um, that there are assumptions I don't know how many times when my mother would talk about something that she had heard and when I would ask her the source, she would say it was in the Enquirer when she was in the grocery store. And I would say to her, but mother, that's not a legitimate paper. She said, if it's not true, they couldn't print it. And you're off and running in this argument that you, and you can't win, I'm not gonna argue with my late, I wasn't gonna argue with my mother anyway. But in effect, what you find are people who say, but if it, is, if it isn't in the book, then it isn't so. So if it is missing, then it doesn't exist. And if you have other information to bring in, then it gets challenged. There are distortions. There are people or systems or institutions we know, love, trust, and like. Our family and neighborhood, education, media and government, and houses of worship that can reinforce negative stereotypes or reinforce um, our own sense of ethnocentrism by placing us at the center of the universe and all others who don't measure up as being less than. And it gets very hard as one is developing to challenge all of that around us. Uh, if any of you have taken information, I know that I have, that I learned at home, that then someone else told me something else, I guarantee you what I learned at home was more powerful than listening to a stranger influence something that I'm saying, which is why Simmons is so important in the way in which we engage people in beginning to think differently of what happens as you go into, and we internalize that, and as we move into college and other areas, graduate school, placements, et cetera, where we get influenced and come into contact with people who we've been told things about that don't hold true. And so in effect there, we can collude. We become both the oppressed and the oppressor. We have internalized these processes. I don't know what to believe. We view the misinformation as true, but I've been told to stay away. Uh, because I've been told not to go here because I've been told, told, told this distorted information very often based on the facts that people had or their experiences. It isn't, I, I would like to believe that people don't wake up deciding I want to make you afraid of difference, but I don't know difference to help you to know how to embrace it or to understand it. Uh, so that differences are, are not different there are places where we can look at different and, but still see equality, that because we are different, we are still equal versus difference as being wrong or abnormal. And in effect, we have choices when this information comes to us. When we have information that creates dissonance, wait a minute, this is what I've been told about you. I've had so many students say, I've never had, I've had some colleagues, uh, where they talk about the inability to sit with someone who is African-American, male, and have conversations that challenge them to think differently 
and will talk about what they had been told or this was the first time they've had this opportunity. And they're challenging internally some of their preconceived ideas and stereotypes. Or as an American who travels abroad, it's so interesting when I'm sitting with people and I'm sitting and I understand how their governments function. They then look at me and they always will say, I didn't know Americans understood that we existed. Nonetheless, to understand who our prime minister is and how our government works, that's dissonance. They now have to think differently about what they have assumed to be fact. Now, they can say, you're the exception to the rule, and the cycle continues. So you get exempted by being the exception. Or what people can say is, wait a minute, could there be others also who are like this person where my idea about who you are isn't, is not real, it's been shaped by lack of knowledge. And that's the path to liberation. Assimilation. Assimilation means being absorbed into the cultural tradition of the dominant society and consequently losing one's historical identity. That's the old Ellis Island model of when we think about immigration and we think about or you think about your grandparents, great-grandparents, or great-great-grandparents who could not spell their original name and did not know where they had come from or whose language had been lost, but they had assimilated. They, in many ways, they came in and were more American than anything. It was about assimilation. And consequently, one loses one's historical identity, which is very important as a way of helping to anchor us in traditions. Um, we, I see so many people who have come to this country as new immigrants and where indeed what we watch are the children who don't have any kind of historical anchoring and where the parents and children end up in conflict because the assimilation is moved too quickly and the rules don't fit. I see again people nodding their heads. And this is very important as a way to think about assimilation because this is what's been valued. Acculturation is what we see now, and I would argue are some of the tensions that we see um, intergroup and intergroup. That acculturation um, in which there is an adaption to a different culture but retention of original identity. I can be both and versus either or. I can be both and versus either or. So that I do not have to uh, deny my place of origin in order to participate fully here. We're seeing some of this in terms of the assimilation of culturation, I would argue, in some of the areas of biraciality, of people who are saying it is not an either or dynamic for me, it is being both and, which is changing discussion about the way in which we socially construct race. Uh, it's a very powerful piece, and in effect, that, that power of saying I'm not going to be either or change the decimal, sense, the decimal census, which is mandated by the Constitution, which was changed to include biraciality by virtual people refusing to check boxes. I'm not going to choose one parent over the other. And so the ways in which we think about acculturation and assimilation, and also so powerfully about how we think about this in terms of immigration, of what does it mean when people still hold on to language, customs, traditions, beliefs, which is very different from great-grandparents who had to give that up. And it doesn't surprise me that there's resentment. If I had to give it up and do without, then why can't others go through the process that I went through? Institutional racism is the manifestation of racism in societal systems and institutions. Again, it's the social, economic, educational, and political forces or policies that operate to foster discriminatory outcomes. Um, if anybody did not miss during this election the need for people to watch in certain states how people would have access to vote, what IDs would be required, how people would be allowed to the polls, what mechanisms would be used to disallow people's vote or to disenfranchise the vote, really talks to policies and embedded practices that have to be uh, protected and watched uh, against because they're so embedded into the system and so easy to go back to that one has to stay vigilant or else it's so easy to slip back um, into old ways. It's the combinations of policies, practices, or procedures embedded in bureaucratic structure that systematically lead to unequal outcomes for groups of people. And I would argue here that institutional sexism, 
And that the issue now that has just come out again, as I mentioned about women's access to health care and the disproportionate cost for women versus men is an embedded issue. It's sexism that is driving that. And what is the discussion in our society about childbearing? And uh, there's so many other pieces that are being played out in discussion of this issue um, that is going to speak to some, some necessary reform. Examples of institutional racism include exclusion from unions, inferior municipal services, organizations, social clubs. The way this comes up so often for me during the summer is looking at pools and who has access to pools, which pools get open, uh, libraries, presence of libraries in communities, who has access, access to um, quality hospitals. I've spent most of my life doing community social work, going from neighborhood to neighborhood, and that I could walk into neighborhood stores and buy the smell in a store tell you uh, the quality of the food because you can walk in and anybody who's ever gone into a store where you can smell um, food that is not fresh um, and you can look at the neighborhoods to wonder how is this going on, how is the access different in different communities to quality food, quality products, and it exists. If you doubt it, try, test it. Um, access to nursing homes and other facilities in communities um, becomes a way in which we can find inferior services, admissions based on test scores, seniority systems, last hired, first fired, differential education based on preconceived potential or ability, um, which is very important of looking at those children who get tracked by virtue of race or the way in which they may present themselves that has nothing to do with ability. And so that tracking, um, there is a great piece again uh, last week, uh, last Friday on NPR, um, which was the story corner. I can't believe I can remember I can barely remember yesterday, but I can remember last week, story corner, as so I was driving back from Vermont, and they were looking at the life of Studs Terkel. And Studs Terkel, who was just phenomenal, but Studs Terkel had done a piece on a young man who was a teacher in the Chicago, in Evanston, Illinois. And he was confronting what it meant as a teacher to go in with preconceived ideas about his students. And as a new teacher, he was given what he considered the worst class. Now that's very interesting because in effect what he also talks about was that worst class was also uh, predominantly black Latino and that he began to react to students in a way that predicted that they weren't going to learn because he didn't believe they could learn. And so he treated them as if they could not learn and that they fulfilled that prophecy by acting out and you now have a cycle of everyone being right because in effect what he was doing was behaving in a way that operated on a preconceived idea. What he then went back to realize was that the word went out on the street from parents that this was a teacher you needed to watch out for and that he was on a parent's watch list because in the community he was being perceived as someone who didn't value or believe in their kids. And as he sat down with Studs Terkel to think about what was going on, he couldn't imagine that somehow he had been influenced by race as a factor that had determined how he walked into a classroom on the first day. And when he got that, and I would encourage any of you to go online to listen to this piece, and when he got it, he realized that he needed to begin to teach and that he had to see and begin to identify the strengths that existed in every child, and it changed his life and his teaching. That he had, that's the dissonance or the collusion. He had a moment where he had to make a choice about how he was going to go forward. And he did. Um, we can have income differentials, some being paid more, some being paid less. Uh, we can have monocultural school curricula, who's present, who's not. Uh, indeed, are we looking at school curricula that is very Euro-focused? Or, as I'm learning more and more with younger people, the way in which we learned is just not working with the ways in which younger people learn. My teaching for adult learners has had to become more dynamic, linked to uh, real-world examples that I can go out and pull from YouTube or a podcast or something else that is more than my standing in doing a bit of what I'm doing here today, which is talking at people versus engaging people in ways in which they can go back and reflect. And I tried to model that by saying, you can go hear the real story of Studs Terkel told by going to NPR Story Corner. And in predatory lending practices, anybody miss predatory lending practices the past few months? To understand, in effect, that this is the best example 
of the ways in which we can look at race-based access and what it means in terms of poor and oppressed people. Um, and it is not just about people being greedy on the side of wanting more house for less money, but also that there was someone there waiting and willing to advance that cause and to make money off of the poor who were trying to get a piece of the American deal. Structural inequality is the silent obstacle. Structural inequities have been solidified over time. It's the multi-generational effect of the privileges of free white people as compared with the effect of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, along with prejudicial immigration rules that has resulted in a set of social structures that maintain and reinforce the barriers to the attainment of maximal human potential and dignity. This is very important. This is not blaming anyone, but it's acknowledging facts of how structures exist. And that so often, this, we get into places of talking about racism and oppression as if the only lens through which to look at this is bigotry and that I am not a bigot, therefore I don't want to think about these pieces. But this really talks about shifting power. And that when we talk about power shifting, power sharing, we really are talking about restructuring and acknowledging, in effect, that systems have been created on inequities and that those inequities have, uh, in effect, um, uh, created outcomes that have advantaged some over others. And the ways in which that those are looked at are very, are very interesting, but it takes time. The challenge is to tackle forms of racism that are more subtle than slavery or segregation. To a large degree, the social traditions and values within the helping professions preclude active promotion of the types of racism that are overt or blatant. But we have subtle types of racism. We have symbolic racism, aversive racism, and micro inequities, which is where I want to focus. The symbolic racism is expressed by those who may or may not perceive themselves as racist, but justify their negative judgment of others by asserting that the others do not, do not abide by traditional values of the dominant group. It isn't that I don't like you, but it is that you behave in ways that I cannot condone. Love the sinner, hate the sin. You know, if you would just behave, if you would just do, if you would just do that, blah, 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 and we can all think of examples of what the jest would be, then everything would be okay. But it isn't that I have negative ideas or concepts. It's just that you will not adopt and behave. So they perceive themselves as operating based on certain objective standards or universal truths rather than in opposition to the group based on their race. So it is because somehow this is the way it is supposed to be, therefore you're not doing it, means it is not okay, and you can't be trusted to move ahead or forward. Does that make, are you following? Because this is an important piece, that in effect, one, uh, people may not perceive themselves with symbolic racism as being racist but indeed looking at what is considered normal, good, appropriate behavior, and operating through that lens. So this is not intentive. It is about having a worldview that says this is the way X, Y, and Z is. Aversive racism is another subtle form of prejudice. People who engage in the practice see themselves as non-racist, but they will do racist things, sometimes unintentionally, or they will avoid people without overt racist intent. So that the questions of how to avoidance of contact is another way of thinking about um, this sorts of behavior as a way of not talking about, not being around, of going out of one's way to avoid interaction for a variety of reasons. Um, and this is aversive. People can perceive themselves as being fair and practicing equality by holding forth certain values such as individualism or work ethic or self-reliance and take negative action because the focal group does not share those values. Now, in effect, it gets back to how do we measure? Who determines what a work ethic is? How does that get measured? Uh, it determines what do we mean by individualism if indeed 
One comes from a worldview that it is so important to help each other and it is not about one person over the other, then we already are having a very distinct difference about what responsibility and a work ethic is. Uh, what does it mean, um, as I was talking to someone last evening who was talking about someone from, uh, from, uh, from Tibet, and she was talking about the fact that it is this multi-generational house, and I could hear in the conversation from a friend of mine who's African, all these judgments about, you know, it's the grandmother and the grandfather and the aunts and the uncles and the da, 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 da. And I said, what you have here is a collective. Well, but you know, why can't people get, but what you've applied here is an individualistic lens that says this is the way to do it versus going back to understand how is it done in Tibet and what are people bringing over as a way of thinking about how you know, one ship rise helps every boat rise, I think is the saying, I'm mutilating the saying, but that, you know, we rise together. And how does that get valued or not valued? What they believe about themselves and will attest to is the importance of fairness, equality, and justice. But because they have been exposed to the ever-present societal racism just by living in the United States, they will reflect it in their conduct so that I can believe in fairness, equality, and justice, but still act differently. My beliefs and my actions are not necessarily connected to one another. There can be dissonance between what I believe and in what I do. And if anybody here, and I, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but to ask you to think for a moment, has been surprised in a situation by a reaction, a thought, uh, a, something that's come out of your mouth, and you say to yourself, where did that come from? I didn't even think that I could think something like that about someone. That that is what we're talking about. It, there are things in all of us that surprise us, that have to do with things that have been so deeply embedded in who we are that it takes a situation to bubble it up. I talk about this in some way as being like, for people who are nurses, it's like having a herpes zoster, and where in effect you've had chicken pox, you get over the chicken pox, and as you get older, all of a sudden something stresses you so much that you break out with shingles. And when someone says, but you know, that's the chicken pox virus, it's just laid dormant. It took the right stress to bring it up and out of you. And some of us, it doesn't bubble up because the stress isn't correct. I would argue that what we've just gone through as a process in this country of, of electing a president has surprised people in terms of some of the discussions they've heard or thought with family, friends, colleagues, etc. Or and some of us have been surprised ourselves. I know I have with myself. Um, good people can do bad things, microaggressions, microinequities, and to others in ways for which there is no formal grievance, but still have negative and sometimes unintentional effect. This refers to microaggressions and microinequities. How am I doing for time? Okay. Those tiny damaging characteristics of an environment, as those characteristics affect a person not of that environment. They are the comments, the work assignments, the tone of voice, the failure of acknowledgement in meetings or social gatherings. This is one that so many of my female colleagues and friends have talked about, about what it means to have said something and a man says it and it gets acknowledged in the meeting and you think, I just said that. And then you want to say, wait a minute, I just said that. And then you don't look, you look, well, what, you know, you then get blamed for saying, for saying, wait a minute, I just said that before he did. Well, why do you need so much credit, dear? <laughs> do, I mean, you get minimized and then you look bad if you stand up for yourself and say it. But then on the flip side, if the gentleman sitting at the table says, I just said that. Oh, that's right, Bob, you did just say that. And why is it different? But it's those damaging pieces. Um, my pet peeve, let me share Gary's pet peeve, it's Saturday morning. My pet peeve, my pet peeve is walking down the street anywhere and looking at someone when I've got my coffee, my, my bag, my hat, my tie and everything and I walk past someone and I say, because I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, I was raised to walk by people to say good morning and someone just walks by me. It happens more and more, and I have now gotten to the point that as they walk past here, should I say, I say good morning and it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> because, but you know, in effect for me, by the time I get to work, those dings 
get to you to a place that when you finally end up in a situation, you may overreact and it has nothing to do with the day starting. Your day started with people not seeing you or not hearing you. Or colleagues, if you've heard this, the numbers of colleagues who will talk about, we work together every day and then at lunchtime I cross them and as if they don't see me. Those are micro inequities, microaggressions that to someone else it doesn't mean that people aren't busy. But it also may mean we've been trained to look at people one way inside a safe environment or an environment we see as safe and to not see people when we're ex outside in an environment. And I can argue that I think in a world where we see increased violence, most of us are, have our startle responses up. So it's not like I'm saying good morning thinking the person I'm saying good morning to is safe, but it's just what I think one needs to do by saying hello uh, to someone. And what that means is very important. So I've shared my, my experience. These are not actionable. I can't go up and give someone a ticket and say you didn't say good morning to me this morning. Here's your ticket. Here's your good morning ticket today. I want to see you in court. Um, um, but they're, and they're not violations of laws or policies. They, they've kind of violate the Cleveland, Ohio way of greeting each other, but I can't enforce that. If I was in Cleveland, people say good morning. Um, but there are clear, subtle indicators to, of a lack of respect by virtue of membership in a group or may be taken in as that. You, one may not mean it that way, but that is very much how I might feel about it. And going back to what we talked about, about be, are or is are very different. I, we can argue about, well, I didn't mean it, but that does it. what we need to talk about is how I'm feeling it. Your meaning and my feeling are equally valid, but we've got to deal with the feeling so we can move on. And that comes up a lot, again, anyone who's been in a relationship where you don't get your feelings acknowledged makes it very hard to move on from an issue. Uh, white privilege is the collection of benefits based on belonging to a group perceived, perceived to be white. Because that has varied over time. There are times when people from the Balkans were not considered white. There have been times when people from the Cape Verde Islands, by virtue of having Portuguese on their passport, were classified in the US where race is a classification, were classified as white, whose skin color was my color or darker. So that how one is perceived or classified can vary uh, when the same or similar benefits are denied to members of other groups. It is the benefit of access to resources and social rewards and the power to shape the norms and values of society that white people perceive unconsciously or consciously by virtue of their skin color. I would encourage anyone to read Peggy McIntosh's uh, work out of the Stone Center at Wellesley, which is unpacking the white knapsack of privilege. And I, again, I might be man, uh, totally macerating the title, but it's Peggy McIntosh, and it is her article on white privilege. And it's a very simple, clear, powerful piece that uh, comes out of her work of looking at what is her unearned privilege. And one of the clear examples she talks about is, what does it mean to not walk into a store and think one's being followed? Of what does it mean to be able to go into a, a Band-Aid box uh, and get a Band-Aid that looks closer to one's skin color and not to another. I have a friend of mine who had an amputation and when asked where he was given a, a prosthesis, which he wasn't wearing, and people couldn't understand why he was wearing it. And the prosthesis he'd been given was as a dark-skinned man, he'd been given a white leg because that's what they had and he wasn't going to wear it. But no one had thought that, what, doesn't it matter that you walk? Well, no, it matters that I have something that looks closer to what I look like so I don't feel embarrassed. And so I'd rather stay in my house and feeling uncomfortable to say that, but on the other side of the person who measured not thinking about that, that that would matter. Internalized racism, which we don't talk a lot about, is the development of ideas, beliefs, actions, and behaviors that support or collude with racism against oneself. It is the support of the supremacy and dominance of the dominant group through participation in the set of attitudes, behaviors, social structures, and ideologies that undergirds the dominating group's power and privilege and limits the oppressed group's own advantages. I grew up 
in a house where my uh, dad, who grew up at the height of America's apartheid, uh, I'm 53, I was born late, my mother was born 1916, my father 1919. So my worldview is very different from, it is the worldview of many of my friends, grandparents or great grandparents, in terms of experience. And so much of the message I would get from my dad was about what one couldn't be. What what had he had internalized from hearing over and over and over what he wasn't. And how that played out in terms of decisions about supporting as we moved into, as one moved into the 60s and looking at the emergence of black businesses, et cetera, of what it meant to support his community was somehow that you were going to get less than products, less than service, less than this. And many oppressed groups have this internalized oppression. You can't trust your own because we've internalized that message that has been external for so long, and it's very, very devastating. Um, I would encourage any of you, Beverly Daniel Tatum's book, uh, who is the president of Spelman College, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And her latest book, Why Are All the Black Kids Still Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Um, is very important. Tatum would argue that the black kids are sitting together, but one is also not noticing that all the white kids are sitting together too. And so, in effect, what we notice is very interesting in the ways in which we look at society. Um, the challenge for white people and people of color is to confront these inhibiting forces to the work required to successfully confront institutional racism. Individuals are called upon to acknowledge that by accident of history, they are in positions that give them advantages over others. It's an accident. It isn't divine. It's an accident of birth that people are in positions. Um, and that, in effect, unless we aspire or adhere to a process of oligarchy, uh, that, in effect, that that is privilege that one has not earned. It's an unearned privilege. And that they're being asked to advocate for changes that may disadvantage themselves or their family members. Others are called upon to dare to recognize their own potential power, to mourn the loss of, loss, loss of what might have been, and marshal their energies to seek correction in society's processes. Even allies can be paralyzed against change because of benefits of white privilege or the blindness of internalized racism. I've spent the past few months going back and reading, and if you've not read any of it, the writings of Audre Lorde, um, the great poet, and then also looking at the writings of Adrian Rich, who has done a lot of writing in the area of uh, feminism and feminist thinking, and looking at some of the dialogues between Audre Lorde as she advanced a whole concept of what black feminism was, but also what it meant to be a black lesbian feminist, which was a whole other construct. And that she and Adrian Rich got into enormous dialogues about what it meant if one was truly going to talk about being feminist, then one had to also talk about what it meant to have been in positions of power over and power under, with Adrian Rich as a, a white feminist and Audre Lorde as a black feminist, and both of them being lesbian. Where did they meet, but also where were they unable to meet in their discussions? And it, at times, can be uncomfortable to have these dialogues both with oneself and with each other, but they're very important to do. So long-term approaches that I would recommend are personal growth, professional development, doing what you're doing today. It, you know, to get up on a rainy day, I, and I don't presume it is just me or the topic, I, would I really do believe it is Simmons, um, but to get up and go out and take advantage of those places that cause us to think. It is not to go and maintain what we have known, but to begin to think about what we don't know. It isn't the answers, it's the questions. You know, that in effect, so many of us think we have answers when we don't have good questions. And so it is to think about what do I need to know about who I am, what I've been told, how I've been told it, and what I've been telling, and then how do I go out to find other information it is not just reading the party line, but also being challenged by others who think differently from you. I also am encouraging my students to go back to the original text. I find so often, if I heard one more time someone talk about W.E.B. Du Bois, the soul of black folk, quoted in a text, and I thought, you know what, I no longer really know what Du Bois said. I know what 12 people out said about what Du Bois said, but maybe I should go back to read the original text. <laughs> 
And so I'm going back to original sources to read what was originally intended so that I can determine my own interpretation of what's there versus what 30 different theorists have decided they meant. Interpersonal capacity and collaboration. How do we create for ourselves better ways of working together across our difference and ex accepting being uncomfortable? You know that in effect for many people this election was an, uh, was an amazing opportunity um, to begin to think about issues of power shifts and power sharing. This has also been a major generational shift. It has not just been a racial shift, this is a generational shift. We've watched something phenomenal in New Hampshire happen with the numbers of women elected to public office in New Hampshire, which is, has the highest percentage of women in elected office in the state legislature of any state. It's still not good enough, but it is better than where it was. So that in effect, how will the world change? What is our interpersonal capacity to begin to shift power and to think about how power looks. And that has meant how many people have looked at who, well, how did they support a candidate who 40 years ago one would not have even been able to imagine as a candidate. You know, that the interpersonal capacity and collaboration for many of us on the other side in this campaign and of looking at Barack Obama, John McCain, and looking at this campaign of looking at and thinking about as an African American man, what does it mean? Can I wake up tomorrow supporting a candidate who may look like me? What does that mean? Because I never thought that was possible. And then what was I going to do the day after when I woke up and uh, President elect Obama had been elected? And it was almost like the world was up. What, what does this, who am I in this world? It was like a fugue state. And I own that because I have to go in and look at some of my own messages about what does all of this mean for me <laughs> in terms of what does it mean about the issues I'm confronting. Organizations becoming anti-racist entities are really committing to do this work in organizations, in our communities, in our churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, and all the places we do this in our educational institutions of committing to working on ending racism, that racism affects both blacks and whites and others equally. It's an equally opportun equal opportunity employer. There's a cost for racism for whites as there is for blacks and other people of color. It is an enormous cost. I think the great challenge is trying to hold on to something that people don't even understand that they have. And what does it mean to think about how does one begin to move any of that? And who do you talk to without appearing to not know? And it is so important to be able, I believe, to acknowledge that we're all in a place where we don't know. We've all been given bad information about each other and the world around us. And what does it mean as we go forward and begin to have dialogues? It is so interesting how many of us want to reach out when we travel the world to talk to the locals, but we don't do the same thing in our own backyards to talk to each other. We'll spend fortunes going all over the globe to dialogue but when we could turn to someone sitting in a train or in a bus and just say, how are you today? It's not about what do you think, but how are you? Who are you? Just taking a risk and putting it out there. The words, the smallest word in the English language is no, yet it's the one we seem to be the most afraid of, is hearing the word no, so we avoid it. And then focusing, and my perspective is focusing on my clients, but focusing on our friends and families, community, and social policy to look at the rules that govern us as a way of trying to influence, to think about who's not included in this. I've three times talked about as a man, what upset, has upset me over the last few days, and I guarantee you I'm writing letters, I'm calling, is understanding now someone has told me Freire, Paolo Freire says that knowledge is not neutral, that once you know something, you have to do something, and not doing it is making a choice, but to own it, not to pretend you didn't make a choice. Of what does it mean for me when I hear, in effect, that women are, dis are being charged more for health care than I am individually, not as part of a group? Well, I could decide, well, you know, I'm just one person. I have nothing to do with that. But then I have goddaughters. I have three goddaughters. I don't want them to be disproportionately impacted by this. And if I didn't, don't I have an obligation to do something when I know that somehow, in effect, men cost more as we age, but Medicare kicks in. It's very interesting. So that it, the, high, the most expensive time is for women during childbearing years. Something's not right about that. 
And so in effect, one has to look at social policy and become involved in a way that doesn't maintain patriarchy but supports. So we can assume responsibility for taking action. Um, we can take action to engage our own organizations. We can partake in actions, large and small. Uh, I tell my students all the time that every movement started with one person getting tired. Movements don't start with a thousand people running out in the street at the same time. It just doesn't work that way. It looks like that in the movies. But it really does require one person deciding, I really am not going to do this this way anymore. I'm sitting down. I'm not going to show up. I'm going to tell you no. I'm going to do something. And I'm so tired, I don't care what the risk is. Because the consequence to me of not doing something is weighing me down more than taking an action so that we can all do something. Um, that we can recognize and create awareness. We can talk to our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews. The holidays are coming up. It is amazing the opportunities within our families to begin to talk about issues and to say, I was at a lecture and heard this. What do you think about this? This is what I'm thinking about this. I don't know what I'm thinking anymore about this. Let's talk. I would encourage um, whites in the world to be able to also embrace talking about whiteness. It is amazing. My partner, who is white, often talks about going to my family and how much we talk about race. I said, of course we do. And his take on the world is, we never talk about race. And I said, of course you don't. Race is not the predominant part. Whiteness is not something we talk about in the world. And so what does it mean that one doesn't talk about it? And it's evident in the world. So what does it mean that one doesn't talk about what that means? It isn't negative, but it's to acknowledge its presence. To dialogue and inclusion, planning for internal change, organizing for change, and challenging the status quo. Um, conventional wisdom, and more recently, neoconservative ideology, state that sufficient progress has been made in improving the iniquitous situation of people of color in the United States. And there will be those who will say that, indeed, the uh, the historic election speaks to how things have changed. The implementation of affirmative action policies, for example, has led a large number of Americans, predominantly white females, who have really been uh, um, um, uh, supported and helped by affirmative action, and particularly programs such as Title IX, to believe that more than enough has been accomplished. Yet, the striking antithesis of such perceptions is that many Americans continue to exist in a social chasm, the formal causes of which are not a great secret to anyone. Their hunger, their housing, their crime, their illness, their lingering patterns of political and societal and economic oppression. Without exception, this chasm is disproportionately inhibited and inhabited by people of color. Racism in its personal, professional, and institutional forms permeates the life situations of ethnic minorities. And, and as citizens seeking to preserve their rights, and as clients of social service agencies, law firms, hospitals, etc., anywhere one goes, these things play out um, in our country. Audre Lorde has said, it is not the differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences that divide us. And so in closing, what I'd like to ask you to do is to think about some questions. Um, and the questions are as follows. And then I don't know if there's time for comments or questions. OK, great. Um, and I think about this for, for those of you over the past week. This week, two weeks, I'll even give you a month. You can choose. You can be four weeks, two weeks, or one week. How many of you have seen opportunities for interpersonal micro dialogues about race and oppression? How many of you have seen opportunities to talk about race and oppression? How many of those opportunities have you taken? How many have been in front that you've seen but how many have you taken and been a part of? How would you describe what the opportunity was? If you had to talk about what the opportunity was, what, how would you describe it? Was it in a grocery store? Was it at the mall? Was it at a gas station? Was it um, in a cab? I spent a lot of time in cabs. Fascinating conversation with cab drivers. 
you know, fascinating conversations. Besides, why are we starting at $2.60? But uh, let's not go there. But fascinating conversations with taxi drivers about life. What, what, kept you, what kept you from engaging or initiating these conversations? What stopped you or what propelled you? What stopped you or what propelled you? And then, if you engaged, what helped you? And when you think about conversations that one has had, um, again, if I use my cab driver friends as a, as a question, I'm more apt to get engaged in conversation when the cab driver says to me, how are you doing today, sir? What's, we are, we're off and running. Even if I don't want to talk to them, I, I'm from Cleveland. I've got to speak, so I've got to start. That's the Cleveland way. So if you're going to have a conversation, I've at least got to go through starting with you. And then, does the presence or lack of presence of diversity make a difference? Is it easier when there is difference present than if there's not? You know, uh, Audre Lorde said, somewhere on the edge of consciousness, there is what she calls a mythical norm, which each one of us within our hearts knows that is not me. In America, this norm is usually defined as white, thin, young, heterosexual, Christian, and Audre Lorde puts Christian with a small c, and financially secure. It is with this mythical norm that the trappings of power reside within society. Those of us who stand outside that power often identify one way in which we are different, and we assume that to be the primary cause of all oppression, forgetting other distortions around difference, some of which we may ourselves be practicing. So I'd be interested in your thoughts and in hearing and, and speaking with you. And I'm going to move from behind my old open one for podium. Yes. Uh, I wonder if, as you want to talk now about that part of your California. California. Oh, oh, yeah. I do see it as a civil rights issue. I see it as an issue where people are being excluded uh, their rights and acknowledgement of relationships and are being denied access to over a thousand benefits um, that other people have in this country and in the state, great state of California. I find it ironic uh, that in the great state of California, which in 1948 was the first state to go on record to proclaim that anti-miscegenation uh, could not be the law of that state and recognized interracial marriages would be the state that would pass Prop 8 that said that over 20,000 people, um, one couple whom I married who have been together for 42 years, they're two of my oldest friends, they fell in love in, as freshmen in, high, in, freshmen in high school, freshmen in college, have been together for 42 years. Anybody know anybody who's been together 42 years who wants to get married? We may know many who want to get unmarried, but people who want to get married. And in effect, what they are right now is in a limbo about whether or not they have a legal marriage or relationship, and it was about accessing benefits, insurance, and protecting their real property, both here in Massachusetts. So I, I see it as a civil rights issue, um, and I think that the, the, the schism that's been created that says somehow um, it isn't has been uh, political strategy, but I also think on the side of the, uh, done some writing on this, and I'm going to be standing in the rain at 1.30 today in a strike that's going on around the country in every major city to protest Prop 8. That in effect what happened was that people, and I would argue that there was an organized group of people who used particularly black churches and Latino churches and others as a way of getting something done that they could not take on straight on, but also that the white gay structure didn't come into communities and do the networking that they should have done, which is why this is lost. There's a great piece on the web now. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I, I just want to comment. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the benefits. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that if what we're going to have is separate but equal, one could get them, but I don't know that one wants to advance a separate but equal um, uh, um, uh, how would I put it? Uh, 
I, I'm not a, a proponent of advancing separate but equal. What if we're going to do that where it's civil unions, then make everyone's marriage, a, every relationship a civil union. I can tell you how to fix this. You split the religious side from marriage from the civil side, which most other countries do, and this would not be as complicated. Churches have a right to say no to who comes in to marry them, but that is different. In every other country in the world, you have two ceremonies. You have the religious ceremony. Canada, you stop the religious ceremony. You move to another table. You sign the documents, which is the civil, and you move back to complete the religious, at least the ones that I've been to. And so I think that it is really about how we talk about these pieces. Are people aware that in the Commonwealth, in the Supreme Judicial Court in, this country, in our state, the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, is where separate but equal comes out of? So the great irony is, is that separate but equal had to do with a case about a uh, runaway slave and the way in which that slave was then how it was adjudicated, and it created separate but equal. And I want to say, and I'm doing this now at the top of my head, which is dangerous, I will make sure that Loretta gets this citation, um, but I believe it comes out of, uh, of Shattuck. Lemuel Shattuck was the justice, I believe. Um, and in effect, what this great Commonwealth did was to create separate but equal, saying there are two systems. That's why when the Supreme Judicial Court made marriage legal in the Commonwealth, it was distinct in talking about undoing separate but equal. It knew what it had done, and then that became the law of the land and was applied to race around the country. There is a historical reason that our court took that language and said what it did, was in effect it went back to undo something it had done over 140, 150 years prior. So it is, so I agree, I think that if we make it level, I think it's to make it level, move, and I'm, so I, I'm not someone who doesn't belong to a church and I, all that stuff, but that we separate these things out. But as long as there's going to be one class for one group, there needs to be one class for everybody because you start these multiple tiered systems, that's where the discrimination runs in and becomes rampant. And I encourage people to disagree with me about that, that's fine.